Hello, my name is Kerry Arthur, and this is the first episode in a little series where we're going to take a look at some of my favourite books from the Horror Heresy. This is originally going to be like a my top five books, my top ten books from the Horror Heresy novels, um, but then I realised that I can't actually decide what the top five are, only that this book is most definitely on the top five list, but that it sort of shifts around in terms of order below this particular one, and I can't really make up my mind as to what would be on the top five because so many of them are so good. This one, however, is always pretty much at the very top of said list, um, even if the rest of the list changes from day to day. And it's the first heretic. So we're just going to talk basically a little bit about the first heretic and what makes it, I think, one of the standout examples of just a really, really good book in the Horus Heresy series. And I mean, the very basis of it for a start. I think it's kind of tricky and it's one of the reasons I love the book so much it is dealing with one of the Primarchs that I think is hardest to characterise, that is hardest to describe because of all of the Primarchs Lorgar is the only one I would say outside of Angron who at least in a personal sense didn't feel like he belonged he makes the comment that all of his brothers were generals, but that's not what he wanted to be. He finds himself questioning his own existence, and for a essentially demigod, a human being that has been scaled up and made incredibly resilient, incredibly intelligent, faster than any, any being that you could care to name, not knowing your place in the galaxy is kind of a tricky thing to get across. Primarchs are superhuman in every sense of the word and with that you would think would come a sense of purpose and indeed if you look at the other Primarchs, if you look at the examples of like Gilliman and Lionel Johnson and no, even even some of the other traitor Primarchs, I mean Kurz was messed up in the head but he at least had a fairly rigid set of beliefs, he at least had a fairly solid idea of who he was and what his purpose was Lorgar didn't really have any of that, which I think the fact that it he was made to be almost described to be more human, and yet it was still perfectly clear that he was not human in the slightest, I think is a an example of very good book writing. I think it's one of those cases where on paper it shouldn't really work. Trying to make out a demigod as someone who has essentially a lack of confidence and feels as though they do not belong it's not an easy thing to do and yet that is exactly what was managed the actual character of Lorgar as well I think is something that is more interesting than a lot of the other Primarchs just because of how much it changes it it kind of he starts out in that attitude of not really knowing who he is in the grand scheme of not just like the Emperor's sons but the galaxy as a whole like his actual being itself and by the end of the book he has found a purpose he's found a confidence that he absolutely had lacking to start with I mean it's manifested in the fact that his psychic power comes in fits and bursts he's able to use psychic power but it's not consistent it's not something he has a particular control over it's always just been there one second and gone the next as he starts to actually find what he's looking for and as he starts to work out who he is as a person his strength actually grows in a dramatic fashion and in fact the follow one of the follow-up novels to um no not novels one of the follow-up stories uh, to uh the first heretic is aurelian which is again it's a really good short story because it basically shows what Lorgard did to reach his his nearly full potential because I'd argue that Demon Primarch is more full potential than just unlocking your psychic might which is what Lorgard did but that that does a very good job of showing the absolute contrast between the Lorgar that sets out on the pilgrimage after the events of Monarchia and the Lorgar that you end up with during the Horus Heresy itself he treats the city of Monarchia as I believe that's, I'm probably pronouncing that completely wrong, but he treats that as like the ultimate, exa ultimate, ultimate example 
of success for the word bearers. It is a emperor fearing place of worship. It is a city that is absolutely part of the Imperium. They are 100% loyal. They have accepted the emperor as a god, which is exactly what the word bearers went around and did. The city was destroyed. It was killed as an example to the word bearers of, you have royally screwed this up in every single way. You alone have failed the emperor. It's that that event at the start of the book is part of the rebirth process for Lorgar. Now, of course, he's not just doing it by himself. One of the other things I love about the book isn't just the characterization and the evolution of Lorgar himself. It's the introduction of what I would call the the corrupting elements of the word bearers. The, um, those beings that already had kept their old faith, which was based around the worship of chaos, and were attempting to bring it back in a big way, in the form, of course, of Corferon and Erebus, who are, undoubtedly, much as though I am a fan of the word bearers and of Lorgar, they are undoubtedly awful, horrendous people. And yet, in a way, despite the fact that they're awful and horrendous and fundamentally unlikable, it's almost difficult to hold it against them, simply because they at least have a strength of belief, they have a conviction that their Primarch lacks. They might have been underhanded about it, they might be using subtle methods to spread their, their doctrine to other legions, they may have planned for it for years before bringing their let's face it, Miles' treachery before Lorgar and successfully persuading him to essentially go along with it. But they at least have that strength of belief. They have that faith that is almost completely unshakable. I mean, Erebus is, I think, an unequivocally evil character. You know, he, he, he knows what he wants to do. And he is absolutely aware that what he's doing is kind of disgraceful it's kind of disgusting i mean he has no problem killing members of his own legion he has no issue with sacrificing those who need to be sacrificed because the important thing is not the lives of his brothers the important thing is not the lives of the people around him it's simply that humanity knows the truth and he will be the one to bring humanity the truth he is undoubtedly one of the most unpleasant, unlikable characters in the entire series. And yet there is a strength of character there that, even though he is awful, you kind of have to sit there and go, I really fucking hate that guy. But he knows what he's doing. Now, I would say that Corfeiron has a similar attitude, but Corfeiron has an arrogance that... Well, Erebus does have an arrogance, but Corfeiron has an arrogance that I feel is undeserved, and it's shown um, in other books that his arrogance is possibly slightly more misplaced than Erebus is. is. Um, but the introduction of those two characters, of their relationship with Lorgar, and the way they kind of shape the future of the word bearers, and the way that they successfully... I wouldn't say manipulate their, their father into the worship of or at least the discovery of what i would probably call true chaos in terms of accepting its power and accepting the fact that it can change and alter the fabric of the universe and the fabric of the people who worship it um they they're good characters they're not nice characters they're not pleasant characters but in terms of writing and narrative and kind of creating a compelling person to read about they are definitely good characters there's also like a human element to the whole word bearers legion in this book that is i think very very interesting because it is such a contrast to the message that they end up spreading throughout the imperium and the chaos that they usher into the galaxy i mean the word bearers have an almost out of place amount of guilt they have a i think a, a connection to the rest of humanity that a lot of the other legions seem to completely lack yes they don't care for the lives of the people who pour onto their ships in the wake of the rebellion against the emperor they don't care for the cultists they don't care for the worshippers they don't care for those who lay down their lives fighting for them they're not bothered about that but at the same time, 
they have the use of a confessor in the form of Serene Valent- Valantian, which I always remember to try and pronounce the first name right and can never get the second one. Um, she is just human. She gets a lot in the way of rejuvenate treatments and so on, but she was a survivor from Monarchy. When it was destroyed, she was one of the survivors. She was blinded by the orbital barrage that destroyed the city. And the word bearers, they treat her with a reverence that is is not befitting of a legion. It's more befitting of a congregation of normal humans. There is an element to the word bearers legion as a whole that is so much more... I guess innocent, so much more needing of validation, and yet they are the one legion that didn't get validated. They did their best, they tried their hardest, they created, you know, a lot of very, very loyal world, worlds in the name of the Emperor, and yet they didn't do it the right way, so they didn't get the validation they required. And they descend into chaos worship, they descend into human sacrifice, into ritual magic, into the summoning of demons, and yet even as this stuff is happening, they still go and speak to Serene Valantian. I don't know why I keep saying the last name. The Blessed Lady, we'll call her that, that's easier. And they confess to her. It's it's such a it's such an interesting like contrast between the the 40k word bearers, I guess. The kind of the cackling villains, the haha, we shall summon demons kind of vibe that all too often word bearers seem to get lumped with. And the legion that they started out as fiercely loyal, completely dedicated. Yes, they worship the emperor as a god, which is not what you're supposed to do. But at the same time, they had a very human element to them, more so than I feel the other legions did. Their overall evolution, even though they went, you could technically call it the wrong way, even though they rebelled and they strayed away from the Imperium and ended up actively fighting the Emperor and his forces, it's one of the more interesting evolutions out of the whole series. Because it's one of the few evolutions that, for the most part, wasn't driven by ego or a lust for power or a sense of of absolute betrayal it wasn't like it wasn't like angron's attitude where he felt from day one that the emperor had betrayed him it wasn't the kind of insane thought processes of kurz it wasn't the bitterness of paturabo instead there was an element of needing to find the truth and having found the truth committing to it absolutely it sort of transcends the whole I'm rebelling simply because I don't like this and becomes something so much more interesting for the word bearers, which is one of the things that I think the book makes so incredibly clear and does so very well. And it also plays up the loyalty that the word bearers have. I mean, Lorgar is deeply flawed for a Primarch especially, even for a person he would be deeply flawed, but for a Primarch especially, he is deeply flawed he has a need for acceptance and he has a need for I guess honesty and truth and when you actually look at that aspect of his character it's just not difficult to see why he would turn from the Emperor because the Emperor is a being that is clouded in mystery he is not honest he does not speak truth instead he he manipulates and he tries to protect it's not out of maliciousness it's not something where he's sitting there going what is the best way to manipulate these people into doing what i want it's because he has an overall vision for humanity but his overall vision for humanity was not supported by like a fundamental truth of the universe and the way that lorgar was built the way that lorgar was made he needed to find that fundamental truth and when he did even though he didn't like it he knew that other people had to know as well there is in a very strange way a purity to the treachery of the word bearers compared to the treachery of the other legions i mean you could argue yeah it's it's down to a corrupting influence from chaos obviously pretty much all of the falling of the legions is down to a corrupting influence from chaos but whereas 
Fulgrim is slowly taken over by the sword that he took from the lair, which I again I probably pronounced that completely wrong. Whereas Angron was essentially driven into a need for vengeance by the treatment of the Emperor, where Kurz had his visions, where Paturbo had his bitterness, whereas Mortarian had his you know his own hang-ups and dislikes of the Emperor based around his childhood. Lorgal didn't really have much of that. His journey to find the truth of the universe and to the eventual discovery of what chaos is and what chaos could do, that was spurred by what he felt was a betrayal. That was spurred by a an act of retribution by the Emperor against him when he felt that he hadn't done anything wrong. But it doesn't actually take that long for him to go from it being an act of an act of rebellion to just an act of wanting to know the truth. And that's so much more meaningful, I feel, than turning because you're angry or turning because you don't trust something. It has it has a more human, more kind of naive element to it, which is one of the things that makes the book so interesting. It's that really good contrast between the human element, the superhuman element, and essentially the uncomfortable marriage of the two, and what it could and did lead to. So yeah, for that, and I suppose many other reasons, uh, like specific instances of stuff, descriptions of various... I mean, again, another good example, Argyll Tal, who really I should have mentioned before this, again, an incredibly compelling character, a character who willingly takes on burdens that no one else would he doesn't just interact with the custodies who are sent to watch over the word bearers after the events of monarchia he actively befriends them he actively becomes part of their group he is the only one of the word bearers who actually makes an effort to understand them and to communicate with them knowing that at some point there would be a chance that they would be betrayed and keeping up that pretense even after one of them has already been betrayed. He punishes himself for the fact that they've found a truth that they don't like. He accepts a demon into his own soul, into his own body, causing horrendous, terrible changes to his very form, while at the same time acknowledging that the truth that they found and the truth that he's dealing with is not the truth that he wanted. He's a very self-flagellating character. He has a lot of, I guess, a lot of internal strength, a lot of external strength, but he also seems acutely aware that what they have discovered and what they are bringing to the rest of humanity is horrifying and something that really he would rather didn't exist at all. He's an excellent character for the word bearers because... Whilst you do have characters like Erebus, you do have characters like Corfairon who are prepared to just drive at it, you know, at all costs. It doesn't matter who dies, who gets hurt, what happens. The only thing that matters is the truth. There's also that really nice counter that, again, is the very human aspect of characters like Argyll Tal and Lorgar, who are aware that the truth that they've found is not the truth that they wanted. It's not what they're after. It's not what people will want to know about. They don't want to worship gods who demand blood. And yet, that's just how it is. And they have to tell people what the truth is. It's it's really, I think, one of, if not the best book of the Horus Heresy series for me personally. Um, in terms of things like battle descriptions and stuff like that, they're all pretty good. But in terms of just pure character, of different facets, of different legions, of the, I guess, the underhanded, subtle approach by which the word bearers are able to infiltrate other legions and spread their, spread their truth, it's 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 right up there. It's it's right up there. It's probably the best book in the series for me. Anyway, good grief, that was long. I hope you enjoyed listening to that. Hopefully this video does okay, because I want to talk about more of this stuff. Which was your favourite book in the series? Did you like the first Heretic as much as me? 
do you think that it is one of the best books in the series or do you think that there's one that takes that mantle let me know in the comments below i'd be interested to what you think about this and whether you want me to do any more if you'd like me to make more of these videos then do say so um if not then i won't do any more <laughs> it's pretty much up to you Thank you very much for watching. Feel free to click any of the links on the screen, video description, video description, videos, Patreon, subscribe, all of that shit. Click it if you like, don't click if you don't want to, and I will see you for the next one. Toodaloo.